Thanks for staying with us on The Real Story. National attention this week on the State of the Union speech. President Biden addressing a divided Congress and making a speech with moments sure to go down in congressional history. Fox 61's political reporter Emma Wolfhorst is here to help us recap. Emma. Hi, Jen. It was definitely a historic State of the Union address. It's traditionally actually written into our Constitution. Every year, the president gives this speech to not only share where we stand as a country, but to promote his own administration's values and priorities moving forward. Now, this year in particular, the State of the Union had a lot of attention because, like you mentioned, President Biden addressing a newly divided Congress. That's why his message full of calls for bipartisan work. That new GOP majority in the House was certainly rambunctious and, and both sides of the chamber actually making noise and responding to the president throughout his address. Boos, cheers, and even shouts of liar from prominent Republicans certainly made for a State of the Union that's still making waves. Before and after the address, though, serious conversations making progress in Congress. Each member does get to invite a guest, often someone who represents their current initiatives and focus. Our senators brought some special Connecticut people to Capitol Hill to hopefully get their message across the aisle. Senator Chris Murphy brought New Haven Mayor Justin Elliger, and Senator Richard Blumenthal brought an advocate who's actually joining us now. Jen. Emma, thank you very much. Yes, Alex Pletsis, a former Pentagon official and an Army combat veteran who helped evacuate hundreds of Afghans following the U.S. withdrawal of troops, was there for the State of the Union address as Senator Richard Blumenthal's guest. And now he is joining us on The Real Story this morning to talk about his experience on Capitol Hill. Thank you so much for being here today. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. First of all, thank you so much for your service to our country. Uh, we are indebted to you, no doubt. Um, and uh, want to talk about your experience at this historic uh, State of the Union address, because watching it on television, it looked intense. I mean, there was booing, there was cheering. It looked like, you know, President Biden was holding court with people, answering the audience. So tell us where you were seated and what you saw. Sure. Uh, senator Blumenthal is quite senior amongst the uh, the senators. And so uh, each senator is afforded one guest, as is each member of the House of Representatives. And so the members sit uh, on the floor of the House of Representatives because it's a larger space than the Senate, as there's more reps. So uh, I was seated uh, on the first row of the balcony directly across from the president, dead center uh, in the House. Uh, so right below me was sort of the center aisle. So directly below me and to the right was uh, Congressman George Santos, who wedged himself on the edge. And then kind of ironically enough to the immediate rear far left of the chamber was uh, I think it was described as the squad and then off to the far right in the back side of the chamber was uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and a number of her colleagues. So that was kind of the layout and President Biden was directly across from me. I know you were tweeting so I was reading through all of your tweets because they were fascinating. You were seeing you know George Santos's uh, interactions or lack thereof interactions with some people on the floor there and then the, the shouting back and forth right. Uh, what yes. was your take on on the experience because you know there was a lot of talk of bipartisan Partisanship, and there was a show of bipartisanship, and there was plenty of where everyone was standing and clapping on both sides. But your yes. take on the drama that you saw? Yeah, I mean, there were a number of issues that were raised where there was common ground and there was, uh, you know, rounds of applause where everyone was standing. Uh, but there were definitely issues where there was a very clear partisan divide. Um, I think, you know, 10 years ago, maybe a little bit less, the first instance of somebody responding out loud to a president speaking, there was a Congress member who yelled, you know, you lie at President Obama. And it was a massive scandal. And now, less than 10 years later, this looked more like prime minister's questions in the UK than the decorum that we're used to seeing. So, um, you know, some of the president's supporters in the back left of the chamber, you know, were responding and, and yelling and, you know, in a positive way, but, you know, very audibly, it was, you know, noticeable across the chamber. Uh, and then when there were things that they didn't like or perceived to be untrue, there were members from the other side of the, uh, the opposing party who were then, you know, screaming, yelling back, yelling liar. Uh, and I picked one particularly tense moment, I think, was the president uh, leveled an accusation that I think Republicans wanted to sunset Social Security and Medicare, which they took uh, exception to. Uh, the caucus unanimously, uh, you know, both the House and the Senate seemed to respond uh, and, and booed and basically said it wasn't true. So uh, I was quite astonished. I was expecting a little bit more decorum. Um, uh, it was interesting to see. And then, yes, as you mentioned, uh, George Santos was directly below. Senator Romney walked up. I couldn't hear what was being said, but Senator, or, but Congressman Santos was facing me and I could see his face. Uh, and it was pretty clear, uh, you know, he didn't expect the dressing down that he was receiving is the fact they shouldn't have been there in the first place. Yeah, fascinating, that's for sure. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the work that, that you're doing right now. You sure. have been a tireless advocate about making sure Afghan refugees get 
what you believe they're due because of the role that they played uh, with you all over there. First of all, talk about what you did over in Afghanistan and what made you want to help afterward. Sure. I mean, my, my combat experience was in Iraq. So, I mean, uh, I had, when I first moved back to Connecticut after, you know, 12 years in D.C., including college and tours overseas, um, we actually sued the State Department on behalf of my Iraqi interpreter and 11 others to get his uh, special immigration visa that he should have been awarded, and eventually was, which is where I first foray into the, uh, you know, the interpreter space and helping. Uh, I was in Afghanistan in 2012 as a civilian intelligence officer for the Department of Defense, um, and uh, so it was a decade ago. And... Um, you know, I kind of foresaw the issue with the interpreters. I started tweeting about it about six months before the collapse. Um, Afghanistan itself, you had concentric basing rings on the outside. So you had what we call combat outposts, very remote outposts at the edge of the country, then slightly larger forward operating bases, a little bit better secure, and then camps and airfields. So like three concentric rings of basing in the country. As we collapsed the, our military forces so that they would withdraw, we didn't take any of the vulnerable population that were eligible to come to the United States, including the interpreters and their families, with us. So when the collapse happened rapidly, we essentially created a strategic choke point where there was one airfield that was operational, and it was in Kabul with a single airfield, like one runway. So you basically had almost a quarter of a million people that needed to get out of the country who had one single place to get out of, and they had to come from all over the place. So uh, that created a very hectic, dramatic scene, which unfolded on the news. And essentially what we all did collectively, I mean, there's thousands of volunteers and hundreds of groups still working. We all are operating under the banner of Afghan EVAC coalition. Um, the State Department, Department of Defense were running the operation, right? The State Department said, hey, these people are eligible. You need to be at this place at this time with this paperwork to evacuate. Now, you can imagine in a country with limited infrastructure, people who don't understand American bureaucracy and everything else, mm -hmm. quite, quite daunting tasks. The gates had English names that didn't translate for them. So had to help with paperwork, transportation, safe housing, food, water, medicine, and in some cases where there were sensitive folks or, you know, in one case, four underage kids whose mom was in the States and dad was missing, uh, you know, had to get them into base without paperwork, which past Taliban checkpoints was difficult. So working with former friends who were CIA uh, officers still serving, they were manning a special checkpoint, which was unknown to the public at that point. It's, it's all over with now, so it's not anything sensitive to reveal, mm -hmm. um, and was able to get them inside the airport uh, until the last plane left. And then subsequent afterwards, uh, our group uh, basically uh, stood up uh, legally a logistics and a transportation company, everything else, and we began chartering flights out of Kabul about three weeks after the uh, the airport shut down. We were the first ones to get flights out of the country and the only ones to do so on behalf of the U.S. State Department. So we continued to run flights to the fall of 21 until we actually filled up the intake facility in Qatar. Uh, and then we've continued to help support. At the height of our operations, everybody had dumped all the founding members anyway. With the 401ks for about $6 million, raised another five for a total of between 11 and 12. And we were, I think we rented or leased about 70 apartment buildings at the height of operations, mm -hmm. fleet of vehicles. And then we were uh, basically housing and feeding about 10,000 people uh, in multiple cities across the country, uh, trying to sustain them while we waited for an evacuation. So uh, still pretty precarious. There's about 165,000 interpreters and their immediate family members who remain left in Afghanistan, about 50,000 cleared to fly right now. It's just a logistical nightmare. Um, you know, we, uh, we worked hand in hand with the government. It's not a criticism in that sense, but uh, we definitely need some action from Congress, which is why Senator Blumenthal uh, invited us. How, you know, at risk are they at this point? Because it's been, what has it been, how long since um, those, you know, heartbreaking images that we did see play out on the news? Has it been almost two years? It's been about 16 months or so. We know we're approaching August will be, you know, two years coming up. Um, the, the vulnerability is kind of a twofold. So I think a lot of people, you know, fear or hear about reprisals. At, genuinely, at the top level of the Taliban, they've issued like a, hey, you know, uh, amnesty. They've got other fish to fry. They're not really dealing with it. But you can imagine, uh, you know, these Talibs who come from different villages all over the country returning home after 20 years of war and their neighbor down the street, you know, decided to serve alongside U.S. forces as an interpreter, uh, effectively fighting against these people, you know, and their friends may have died in combat. Uh, that they are, you know, seeking revenge in many cases, uh, and that's the that's the problem they feel from a from a physical perspective. But given the economy collapsing, uh, the fact that they had worked for U.S. forces and the security situation, um, there's simply no jobs for most of these folks. So they have no money. Uh, they're living in whatever housing they had that, that before the war, as long as it's safe to do so. Um, and you know, they're 90 99 percent of the country right now doesn't have enough food to eat. 
The electricity was shut off for a while because the bill wasn't paid to neighboring countries, and it's the middle of the winter and it's snowing. And these people are basically sitting around waiting for us to fulfill our promises. Uh, you know, they're, if they have girls, they're not going to school at the moment. Right. Uh, so the situation is just awful. This is not, we, we are allies better than this. Yeah, I know a lot of people, I mean, when I saw that the Taliban was not going to be letting women go to get educated or go to school, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you look at that and it's just, it's scary. It's really scary for the for the folks over there. So you had this prime spot at the State of the Union and yep. um, you were able to, you actually were just talking about there was a dinner that happened before the State of the Union. Yes. That was a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, you were saying. Explain that and, and how did that help you? Were you able to talk to other senators about, I mean, there's yes. an actual bill called the Afghan Adjustment Act that you're pushing, right? Correct. So after the, you know, after Vietnam, after the Gulf War, you know, when we had refugee populations that we had to evacuate because they worked with us, folks were brought over by the U.S. military just as they were this time around, and they were brought into the country under humanitarian parole, which basically gives you two years to get your paperwork together to file for legal status to remain here. Um, and afterwards, Congress has traditionally passed what's called an Adjustment Act to adjust the status of those who have come here to give them a pathway towards permanent legalization. In this case, this bill also calls for additional security vetting, which was something you know that some folks had wanted, given it was out of a war zone. Uh, and unfortunately, there were a couple of senators who held it up the last time around who were no longer in a position to do so. So we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to pass it. But yes, as you mentioned, it's something I wasn't aware of either until this year, because you only see the speech on TV. The Senate has a tradition which they call the Secretary's Supper, which precedes the, the speech. And all 100 senators are invited with their, each of their respective single guests. Uh, and it's actually the same food every year, Senator Blumenthal was telling me. So it's chicken, uh, chicken pot pie, shrimp, almost like a, like a, I don't know, olive oil and parsley with it. And then there was a, they called scalloped corn. So it was like a soft cornbread that they then scoop, scoop into a plate for you. So okay. that's the traditional dinner that's served. And um, it's basically, you know, tables of eight in three separate rooms. And the senators with both parties, it's like personal time. Uh, so I won't, I won't talk about the personal conversations. It's inappropriate to reveal. But for the business side of it, yeah, it was great. Um, you know, I sat down with Senator Senator Blumenthal at the table. Uh, Senator Peters, who is the chair of the Homeland Security Committee, came and sat down with his guest. Uh, Senator Tom Cotton, who's a Republican on the other side of the aisle, he sat down with us, spoke to Senator Cruz, uh, spoke to Senator Cornyn, Senator King from Maine, Senator Risch. Uh, you know, it goes on and on. Uh, we had about 90 minutes uh, to engage with the senators, uh, kind of explain, you know, who we are, why we were there, why we were brought there as a guest. Uh, and Senator Blumenthal, by the way, one of the most underestimated politicians in the state, uh, I mean, consummate professional, he genuinely cares, uh, you know, and was all about, you know, getting business done uh, and really kind of helped work the room to ensure that the folks who needed to hear what was going on got the message. I mean, they were very surprised at the number of people who were left behind, uh, the precarious situation that we're in. No doubt about that. And what do you expect this year after going? Are, are you going to be back in D.C. trying to um, to push that, or you know, what's the next step? You got you had this yep. platform, which was great. Yeah, you know, you're right. So a number of the senators asked for follow up because it's one thing to hear it from me. The legislation is very, you know, that that's something they would have to vote on. So they would need to see the details to understand the policy implications of what it is that's being asked for. And at that point, it's amongst the, you know the elected officials. We are advocates, you know, who are. Um, you know, trying to do our best on behalf of the populations that we're supporting in terms of our allies left behind. But now this is a matter of uh, negotiation over language and policy implementation between the two parties uh, in charge. And then it also still has to pass the House of Representatives. So uh, yes, we back. I'll be testifying before a number of committees based on uh, some interactions that I've had. Uh, and just given some of the work that we're doing, yeah, I'm back and forth to D.C. You know, probably every other, every other week or so, at and, least. And we're seeing this divided Congress. Do you think that we're going to be able to get, that you're going to be able to get bipartisan support for this? I think we don't have a choice at this point, and here's why. Um, the humanitarian parole expires at the end of August. At that point, they will no longer be in a legal status where they can work, right? They could be subject to deportation, which is virtually impossible because you can't deport somebody to Afghanistan at this point. Um, and if you can't work, the last thing you need are 76,000 people who were brought here after experiencing 20 years of combat and then not be able to work and take care of their families. It's just absurd. Plus, the only option they would have if they didn't create uh, an adjustment act if the president doesn't re-parole them, would be to file for asylum. And if you jam the federal immigration courts with 76,000 asylum cases, the federal court system uh, has told us that that will jam it for 10 years, and that doesn't account for the crisis that's ongoing at the southern border. And I believe the American Bar Association, if I'm not mistaken, has also said there's not even enough barred attorneys who specialize in this field to process all the applications in time to ensure that they're not out of status by the end of August. So, uh, you know, there's a six-month timeline implementation, so we're, we're at critical mass right now. And if the Senate and the House don't act, 
uh, they're going to create a, a domestic, uh, you know, inter domestic crisis of international proportions. Wow. All right. Alex Pletsis, thank you so much for coming on The Real Story, talking about your experience. And again, we very much appreciate your service to our country. You too. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for coming on. All right, that does it for us on The Real Story. If you want to watch these segments again, you can head to fox61.com or download the Fox 61 app and watch The Real Story every Sunday at 10 a.m. right here on Fox 61 or streaming on Fox 61+. Plus. Have a great morning.